Can I do it? Here we yeah. go. Here we go. <laughs> Can you see the title slide there? Yes. <laughs> and let's see. I I didn't get a chance to stop my video. I have a limited bandwidth here. We're so remote. Our driveway is three quarters of a mile long off of a dead end road. So we don't have any cable. We have a wireless internet and the speed isn't the fastest, but I think we'll, we'll make it okay. Well, today is twos day, two, 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 two. But we're gonna talk about three DB, is it worth a divorce? And first of all, I wanna, introduce uh, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents. They were married 100 years ago today, February 2nd, 22nd, 1922. Um, so those are, my, those are my maternal grandparents. And we had an ice storm last night and a blizzard all day today. And they were married in her mother, her parents' farm home in Southern Iowa. And there was a blizzard and the best man and the bridesmaid could not make it, but there were some neighbors next, you know, a mile away, and they came over, and they were the best man and bridesmaid. So it was a pretty small wedding for them. But that was a hundred years ago today. My maternal grandparents. So today has been a, a special day for uh, my family. Um, so getting through the pileup, what's a little pistol supposed to do? Is three dB worth a divorce to get that extra three dB out? Well, my hero is not the $100 bill, but it's Ben Franklin. And the, he was the guy that, you know, put a kite up and had a string and a key and, and got a shock. And, uh, you know, he's my hero because of this picture right here. And anybody that can take a 100 kilowatt volt shock and keep a straight face has got to be my hero. So that's why Ben Franklin is my hero. Well, are you spending hours in a pile? Well, there's not too many DX stations on anymore with the COVID, but uh, when, there are, when there are DX stations on, are you spending hours in a pileup calling for, for no avail? Do you hear your friends get through on their first few tries? Have you gotten a bigger amplifier to get through quicker? Do your lights dim or flicker when you call? Does your smoke detector go off? of still getting a bigger amplifier <coughs> have difficulty copying a dx station let your friends listen to them over the you know over the phone i've done that ever go outside in the middle of the night with a flashlight to make sure your beam is pointed in the right direction did you ever get an expensive automatic antenna tuner and the antenna still doesn't work like it should well wouldn't another 3 db help just somewhere what is a db how much is a db how much how do you measure it what really is an s unit well, this is what a dB is. It's a bunch of formulas, it looks like, some kind of a logarithmic thing. But 3 dB is a logarithmic curve. And it's important today because this is Tuesday, two. Every plus 3B is two times the power, and every minus 3B is one half the power. Is one dB enough? Is 3 dB too much? Can you have too many dB? How do you get all the dB that you need? Maybe some of you haven't had supper yet, but are you hungry? How about a nice, thick, juicy bacon cheeseburger with all the trimmings? Well, here's one. It's not very big. We'll call that a minus 18 dB hamburger. Kind of small. Well, here is just a plain hamburger, just a plain bun, a plain burger on a little paper plate. We're going to call that our reference hamburger. So if you add 3 dB to this reference hamburger, what do you have? You have a cheeseburger. So if you add another 3 dB, what would you have? Maybe a triple cheeseburger. What if you added another 3 dB to that? For a 9 dB, a big, thick bacon cheeseburger. What if you added 3 more dB to that? Got a great burger there. What if you added three more dB to that to have a 15 dB cheeseburger? It gets bigger. Okay, what would a plus 18 dB cheeseburger look like? And, you know, we're into antennas, so there's linearly loaded cheeseburgers. There's stacked cheeseburgers. So we've seen the range from minus 18 dB to plus 18 dB with our reference burger in the middle. So that's 1 64th 
of the volume or power of the reference and plus 64 times, you know, that's how big it can be. So how do you make a bacon super duper cheeseburger? Well, maybe it takes some hamburger helper, I guess, I don't know. But what's a little pistol to do? We're gonna take a look at briefly at these topics here, power antennas, propagation, attitude, the pile up and some priorities. So with power, um, it's optional. You can do QRP. It can be a real challenge and QRP can be a lot of fun. And this is a, a contest that I, it's my favorite contest, the RL160 contest. And you can see I entered as QRP and I also got first place world. I've done this eight times and the jury is still out for the last contest we had this fall. So it might be nine times that I've gotten first place world with QRP on 160. The East Coast with QRP can't work the West Coast. The West Coast can't work the East Coast, but here in the Midwest, we can work both coasts. Don't work much DX, but enough stations to get a high score. So to work QRP on 160, it takes some QRO antennas. This is my uh, 160 system. Uh, a pair of full-size cord wave verticals with elevated radials or half wavelengths apart, and I can beam end fire or broadside. So to work QRP on 160, it takes a QRO antenna. I got quite a few dBs there. Ward Silver sent me this graph of two stations in Iowa. The top graph is N0NI, who's about a uh, 200, let's say 200 miles away from me, running 1500 watts um, on 160 meters. And I'm the yellow running five watts. And you can see there are times when five watts is almost as strong as 1500 watts at K8 and D. The other thing you can see at the very end there is sunrise comes, the signal strengths drop. And if you have more power, you can stay on the band longer. So that's one interesting thing from that graph. So if an S unit is 6 dB and you have 100 watts and you get an amplifier to go up to 1200 watts, that's maybe 10 dB. But if you go up to 1500 watts, that's maybe 11 dB more, you know, a couple less units, you know, a short two less units from 100 watts if you get a, a 1500 watt amplifier. So everybody wants an amplifier. Everybody wants a lot of power, but any reasonable amp will work fine to get you up in that 10 to 11 dB uh, gain range. But it's more important, of course, for the lower frequencies. But if it's too big, you're gonna find the weak link in your system, just like this. Well, antennas, let's look at receiving and then transmitting antennas. If you can't hear them, you just simply can't work them. And my philosophy is that any beverage is better than no beverage. Even a little short piece of wire or something is better. And Harold Beverage uh, patented the beverage antenna, just a long wire uh, with a transformer and it uh, picks up signals from one direction. It works like this. It just gives you bigger ears to hear better with. And you know, around here uh, in the fall, I put down a couple bogs because of just the way the traffic, our driveway goes around here. But right now they're buses, beverage under snow. Uh, we still have a lot of snow on the ground here. But there's loops, there all kinds of flags, pennants, K9AY loops, shared apex loops. You can use the neighbor's fence, even some other HF antennas you can use for listening. And if you haven't tried it, you might be surprised what you can hear on your 40 meter dipole or 40 meter beam when you're working 160 meters. Sometimes those things can really uh, uh, surprise you what you can hear. Sometimes maybe just like this. Well, when it comes to transmitting antennas, remember everything works. Everything can put out a signal if you force it enough, but it needs to be efficient. And you know everything works. Even this light bulb works for an antenna. And we'll view this back in a little bit. We'll come back to this antenna, but we're going to call this our minus 18 dB antenna. It doesn't work very well, but it does get out. So an antenna is a conductor that sends RF energy out into the ether somehow. And if it's not up there, at least a little bit, it might as well be a dummy antenna unless you're really into Nevis, some, uh, some local uh, conditions or you know, some local uh, working locally. But there can be some interaction with trees and buildings, roofs, gutters, you know, other antennas, guy wires, uh, other antennas on the tower. I just put up a stack and it just doesn't work like it should. It has a good SWR, but they still don't hear me. Well, there can be a sphere around an antenna where other objects can interfere. And of course, it's proportional to the, the frequency. So, you know, on 10 meters, you know, you can have something 
fairly close and it doesn't interfere, but on 40 meters, you have a bigger circle where there might be some interference. Here's a good diagram or, or picture of that. You can see the lower antenna, the middle antenna, they're in the clear, they're not gonna have any interference. But if you start modeling or working with the antennas at the top, there's a lot of aluminum, a lot of antennas up there, and I'm sure there's gotta be some interaction. Sure, they probably work okay, but if they were individually or by themselves, they might work even better. I don't know, but uh, there's probably got there's probably some interference up there. The feed system, you need some good feed line to, to minimize your losses, put on good connectors, know how to do it right. And every thing that the feed line goes through with switching and phasing controls, there can be a little bit of loss. There's some things that are beyond our control like weather and rodents and, and maybe some abrasion, but the goal is to have no more than one dB of loss in your feed line system. So if we have a 20 meter dipole, a horizontal dipole, we're gonna, we're gonna call that our reference dipole. If you add a second element, you're gonna get four and a half dBD gain with a 10 foot boom. So it's not exponential. If you add a third element, you're gonna double the size of your antenna and you're maybe gonna get another dB. So if you want to get three dB more gain than a three element to go to eight and a half dB, you're gonna to have to have a seven element beam on a 60 foot boom. And if you wanna get three dB more than that, go up to 11 and a half dB, you need a 12 element 20 meter beam on a 175 foot boom. Maybe Tim has a couple of those, but uh, you know, it's just not practical. It's a, a point of diminishing return. And the best bang for the buck are, is a two element Yagi. You get the most for the least aluminum. You get four to five dB for adding one element. And if you go to a three element Yagi, it's not 50% more, it's almost double, 90% more aluminum and weight. And you only get maybe 20% more gain than the original two element beam. So the best bang for the buck is, are the mono multi-band beams. Um, they're more efficient than trapped Yagis that have some loss. Um, you can get several bands on the same boom, and it takes a lot of hardware and dollars and headaches to move significantly past the two element Yagi. So, but stacking, you know, beams can add two and a half, maybe three dB with some complexity. You know, there's more, less aluminum, but maybe more tower, but there are some advantages to that. But this is what they look like, a mono multi-band beam. You can see there's a boom and there's uh, like the one on the left, there's uh, two longer elements and two shorter elements. And the one on the right, there's it, it's obviously a three band beam, but that's what a mono multi-band beam looks like. And they're fairly efficient. So for two elements, um, that's probably the best bang for the buck. This chart, and I have this for uh, other bands as well, but for the upper bands, you know, if you're using a trap vertical over the ground, you're missing a lot. But if you go up to a, just a full size dipole, horizontal dipole at 35 feet, you're going to start to have some fun. Then you go up to two elements, you're going to really get lots of enjoyment and work some DX. And, you know, with bigger uh, antennas, you work, you know, there's some potential there for some, some big scores and contests. And on 40 meters, if you have an inverted V, if you get it up horizontal, you're going to get maybe 6 dB or more gain. And if you replace that with a two element beam, you're gonna get a, another big bump in, uh, in gain. Uh, so if you have an inverted V, go to a horizontal dipole or two elements. And the same thing with, uh, it's the same graph basically, you know, with, by doing a few little things, you can get some enjoyment, an eye opener. You can, with a two element Yagi, you could work almost everything with it. And the same thing with 75 and 80 meters. Yeah, two element Yagi, that's a huge thing. But, you know, a pair of phase verticals or a four square, those are relatively easy to build on the ground. They're safe. They do take some space, however. But you know, again, you know, the, the more antenna or aluminum that you have up, you know, it's just going to be uh, that much better for you to work everything. So the best bang for the buck of the low bands, if you have an inverted V, replace it with something horizontal. Um, and if the higher it is, you're gonna get some ground reflection gain. And then if you go to uh, add another element, so you can, you can get some incredible DBI gains. So in summary with antennas, you know, we start with only so many Watts, unless you have a Godzilla amplifier, but you, if you increase your antenna efficiency, you're gonna expand your performance envelope. And 3dB is a ton, you know, and you can even get more than that if you're with some relatively simple things. Remember, everything works.
Back to this minus 18 dB antenna. Tom Schiller wrote about this in QST. He uh, put this light bulb antenna up and uh, worked 28 countries in the ARLCW contest, like the contest we had last weekend, but I think it was in uh, 2007. And, um, you know, not a lot of countries, but he did make some contact. So the next year he expanded his antenna. I'm stuck here. There we go. So he phased three of them, but didn't do much better. Very inefficient antennas. So we'll talk a little bit about propagation. We'll talk about the, the gray line and muff maps. I'm really slow down here now. Here's a, a map of the NCDXF beacons. Uh, there's 18 beacons around the world. And by listening to them, and I'll show you in a couple slides here, I'll show you uh, uh, how you can use those. But this is the gray line. Uh, you can see that the, the muff uh, kind of follows the gray line, like on the right side there. So the propagation is enhanced along the gray line. And by looking at these muff maps, you can kind of plan your, where you're going to work your DX. Um, by uh, looking at the frequencies there. And this is, there's some programs that can listen to the NCDXF beacons like Beacon C, and you can see the propagation on the different bands. There's 20 meters, uh, 17, 15, 12, and there's not much on 10 there, but you can kind of see uh, what parts of the world are open by, uh, and what frequency and, and time of day if you watch this uh, uh, carefully. And, you know, our attitude is very important. You want to have fun and you just want it. You want to, you know, desire to work a new country or, or whatever. And so by doing some of these simple, relatively simple things like changing a trap vertical up to just a horizontal dipole, just a horizontal dipole that's not up there, <laughs> you can work a lot. So it takes some commitment and perseverance, takes some butt in chair time and set your goals, develop a plan, know your next, next new one or your next multiplier in a contest. And do a lot of listening. Try and, and make be the first one to make the spot of a, of a station. So attitude is very important. And whenever I enter a pileup, I don't hope to get through. I expect to get through because that's just the attitude I have. I just want to get through. Well, I've been on some de-expeditions, and we'll, I'll show you kind of what it's like from the other side, too. So the de-expedition goals is to make a lot of cues, a lot of contacts. And the QTH and the environment can sometimes be quite challenging, either way too hot, way too cold, windy, whatever. But wherever we go, we try and maximize our antennas for the location. And we try and maximize the propagation windows. And we try and use operators that, I'll say, specialize in certain modes to, you know, to help make the most cues that we can. And we spend a lot of time with our butt in the chair. So you, as a DXer, the same goal, make a lot of cues and maximize your antenna efficiency, both transmitting and receiving, and to utilize the propagation windows and paths, you know, so you can work us when the bands are open to that part of the world, to use and to optimize each of the modes that we use. And again, it takes some time in the chair, you know, to, uh, to be effective. I'll talk a, just a little bit about the different modes here. And CW, we found that 28 words a minute is probably the, the optimal throughput uh, for a de-expedition. Above that, you can work people faster, but the error rate goes up. And uh, usually I work, you know, like a five kilohertz spread and I'm always constantly moving. So listen and watch, uh, plant yourself just ahead for the next cue. You, you, it's fun to see the guys that know how to do that because uh, you, you see them uh, on the scope from my end. And, you know, it, it makes everybody smile when you work each other. And match the speed of the operator. This is what a 80 meter pileup looks like uh, from, this is, I think, from Palmyra. And you can see, you know, th there's a concentration uh, in one spot, but, the, you know, they're spread out and they're relatively easy to work. But you want to stand out like this flower, this one tulip. You want to you stand out, so that's the one I'm going to jump on next. And sideband, I try and work them as fast as I can. I'm constantly moving and it really helps to send full calls instead of saying, um, 
GJ, GJ, you want to say Whiskey Zero Golf Juliet, something like that, because the full calls really help with the speed. Listen and sync yourself with the operator and plant yourself ahead for the next cue. When I say listing up five to 10, this is what the band scope looks like. You can see the pile up there at five up and at 10 up, but very rarely is somebody in the middle or somebody's, you know, the good guys are there in the middle or just off to the edge of the pile up like at the right. That's what a pile up looks like, you know, when you say five to 10 up. So you wanna kind of stand out like this, you know, dare to be different. In Riddy, it's more critical to be alone, to kind of find an open space. This is what Riddy looks like from, uh, this must have been um, Paul Myra also. But you can see when everybody's piled up there, it's kind of hard to uh, decode. Um, now that's almost um, a moot point because most de expeditions now use FT8 um, because you can work faster. So again, you want to stand out and, you know, so that you're easy, easy to pick out. And the and for the digital modes, um, WSJT and uh, FT8, FT4, you know, they're usually different frequencies than the usual uh, watering holes. And a fox and hound mode can, you know, you can work up to three to five stations at a time. On 160, I have seen fox and hound mode, but usually it's only the regular one at a time mode because when you work two, three, five stations, your transmitting power is divided up between those number of stations. So on 160 where you need more power and propagation is a little bit weaker, that's why Fox and Hound isn't used on 160. So watch the waterfall, try and find a place where um, you can be, uh, where you can be seen and the operator can pick you out. And as one operator can operate two to four bands at a time. FT8 can be even faster yet, even though it's one at a time. But this is how regular FT8 works, you know, just one, you know, there's a fox and, uh, and one person at the other end. But when you work fox and hound, uh, one operator can work three or four stations at a time. That's how the fox and hound mode works. Again, you want to stand out, uh, be able to be seen in these pileups. I've never done any EME, but uh, I hear it takes a lot of experience some timing. It takes some big beams and a lot of power. And these guys uh, worry about every fraction of a dB, I know. But... Um, uh, a lot of the expeditions don't use the EME, but dare to be different. You know, maybe not to this extreme. That's uh, quite extreme. That's uh, that's quite an array. And so, getting through the pileup, listen, listen, listen. Look at your band scope. See where the where the weak spots are. Where you might slip your signal in. Uh, pattern uh, the style of the operator and get in sync and uh, match uh, his CW speed. And know where to be. Just uh, know where he's, where to plant yourself to. Uh, uh, for him to pick you up. And then you can also try FT8 on the modes above the muff because it's such a weak signal mode. I've, I've been able to work FT8 uh, pileups when uh, no other mode will work. And you don't see the good ops a lot because they're in and out, but the bad ops kind of stick around and, and call and call and call. But the best investment is right between your ears, you know, learning, uh, how to handle and to see these pileups. Skill is important. You can buy, you know, it doesn't take any expensive equipment, you know, to make a successful contact and uh, like this. Um, but, you know, we've reviewed now our power antennas, propagation, our attitude, and, and, and some of the pileup management skills. And the best return on investment is, I'll say a mediocre radio and a mediocre amplifier. That's gonna do well. You don't need the latest and greatest and the most powerful amplifier. And the outside return on investment, you know, a horizontal dipole or two elements. But if you get more elements, go bigger, the next 3 dB, you know, bigger towers, bigger antennas, four over four on four meters, like the one on the right. And like in Finland, like they had, you know, five elements on 80 and three elements on 160 you know, in a huge tower, but with big vision comes big risk. And it doesn't take long for plus 12 dB to become minus 18 dB. It doesn't take long. And there's always a bigger station than what you might have, except for maybe Tim. Well, maybe W0AIH, this is just one of his three shacks that at uh, Paul's place, but uh, there's always a bigger station than what you have inside and outside. That's what Paul's, I was, when I was 
one of the last times I was at Paul's, I counted, I lost count somewhere around 70 towers or poles of some kind. I mean, it just, you know, it's, it's unbelievable uh, what Paul did. So if you have the DX bug or contest bug, what are your motivations? You know, what are your goals? What's your potential that you can see for where you live and what your budget is? And, you know, how resourceful are you? Um, what, what can you do with uh, the resources you have? What's your family bandwidth? And is it worth a divorce? Well, do you and your spouse have meaningful conversations about where to plant the next tower or how many beams to put up this year? But remember, there's always somebody that's more obsessed than you are. Um, if you think you have an obsession with ham radio, there's some really obsessed guys out there somewhere. You can have fancy cans, fancy equipment, or, you know, simple cans will work too. So it doesn't have to be the best, best and greatest, but the best investment is between the ears. So we've learned that tonight that 3 dB is a logarithmic curve, and every 3 dB is two times the power, and every minus 3 dB is one half the power. Remember, it's Tuesday today, two, 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 two. And we've reviewed what you know, minus 18 dB looks like both in burgers and in antennas. And in summary, you know, family is most important. Do your best with what you have and wisely choose the next 3 dB. And there are some simpler and more inexpensive choices that you can make to be effective. And listen, 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 and be smarter. And, you know, Ben Franklin is my hero, but not this way in a divorce court settlement. Um, but, you know, family first. Remember, family first. And going back to my grandparents that were married 100 years ago today, um, in 1922, if you multiply that times 3 dB, you get 66 years. And you know what? That's how many years they were married, 66 years. Unbelievable, isn't it? Well, my grandfather looks like he might have started out on the wrong foot. His corsage is upside down. <laughs> I don't know if that's on purpose or if that's how he started out. But anyway, if he started out on the wrong foot, it must have been the right foot because they lasted 66 years. That's an amazing story. So thank you very much for your time and uh, sharing what uh, uh, you can do uh, with to get the next 3B, 3DB. And please pass the ketchup. Any questions? Glenn, that was amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. And I, I got to go to five guys now. <laughs> That's really good. How about questions for uh, for W0GJ, our guest speaker tonight? Good. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Got to have somebody has to have a question. I haven't got a question, but I get a big thank you very much. <laughs> well, welcome. thank you, Art. Art. <laughs> um, that, that, that was an amazing presentation, uh, Glenn, and we're, we're going to have a, a follow-up uh, uh, conversation about that for Contest University, because that was just outstanding. Uh, you know, you know I, I, was, I was all ready for this 2-2-2-2-2, two, 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 and, and when that first note came out that it was the 23rd, I thought, oh, no, you know, that's going <laughs> to spoil my talk, you know. So, but, yeah, so, I mean, that... Today couldn't have worked better to work my grandparents into that. Uh, uh, that is just an amazing story, uh, Glenn, with your uh, grandparents. I didn't do the math right, though. 22 years times 3 dB is, but at least it turns out to be 66 in every year. They were married. <laughs> now, there are any other comments or questions for Glenn? I'm going to Wendy's. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> where you corsage upside down that's probably what's that was probably the key for success right there wow 66 years i tell everybody my grandparents were married 128 years the other set of grandparents are married 62 wow so that's 100, that's 128 years wow incredible 
Any questions, uh, comments for Glenn? I have a comment. Sure, Al, go ahead. I like the way you broke it out because uh, sometimes you talk to hams, it's either antenna height or you talk to other hams, it's all antenna. You talk to other hams, oh, it, it's all amplifier. And to where it's a little bit of everything the way you explained it. It all adds up, you know, every, yeah. you know, it all adds up and, you know, it doesn't take monster stations. I mean, they're just some little simple things you can do to, you know, just to improve your efficiency. You know, we, we all can improve. It was great. Thank you. Thanks. Well, Glenn, I want to thank you so much for, uh, for talking to us tonight. Uh, you've been a good friend for tons of years and, um, uh, uh, thank you for all you do for amateur radio and uh, the places that you've gone and uh, the people that you've talked to, um, the training classes that you gave and, uh, and for taking care of, you know, being a doctor on a lot of these uh, trips, taking care of the operators. And it was just a, a real joy to spend time with you here this evening. I enjoyed, enjoyed the time too. And thank you for everything you do, Tim and everybody else here. It's just uh you guys have an amazing club and I, uh, you know, I wish we had more involvement around here um, where we could get something started, but uh, we're just pretty thin around here. <laughs> and we will look forward to seeing you at Hamvention and, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, we'll look forward to hearing you on the air as well. Sounds good. You too, Tim. All right. That's, that's it for this evening. Uh, the Zoom stays up as long as anybody wants to talk. And uh, we will see you next month for uh, the meeting. And in